And away we go. Uh, I just posted the the homework file for uh, for the homework six, which is on momentum. And I just put it so far just in the week 10 day one page, which is where the example problems for today are as well. And uh, let's see, I'm not gonna have you turn it in online this time, but turn it in in paper on paper instead. So we'll have that going. Okay, uh, actually before I do this one, there's another one that I'd like to do first. And uh, this is one that's proton proton scattering and something interesting comes out of this. This is supposed to be an exponent of a five on there instead of 105. Uh, but we have a proton with a speed of pretty quick, 535,000 meters per second, collasting, colliding elastically with another proton at rest. And the original proton scattered 62.5 degrees from its initial direction. What's the direction of the target proton after the collision? And what are the speeds of the two protons after the collision? So let's see if we can figure out all of this stuff as an example of what's going on here, we've got a proton coming into here. Now, in reality, a proton is not going to be at rest. However, uh, wherever we've got it here, yeah, the other proton is at rest. It's possible to select a coordinate system that is centered on this proton whatever its velocity happens to be with respect to some laboratory frame or whatever, you can still come up with a new reference frame that's centered on this. And in that reference frame, this proton would be at rest initially. So that's what we'll have. Anyway, this first one comes in here. And if I call this P1 and this one P2, proton one after the collision, is scattered up at a 62.5 degree angle from the initial. And so I'm just going to write a one on this circle. And then proton two, presumably, is going to be scattered down here. Initially, the momentum is all along the x-axis, if we choose that to be the direction of the x-axis, which we can. And there's none in the y direction. So after this collision, the momentum of proton one in the upward direction will have to equal the momentum of proton two in the downward direction so that that part of the momentums added together will equal zero. So we'll have that going on. So there's the, the situation. We know what um, V1 initial happens to be. There will be a V1 final up here. We know its direction, but we don't know its magnitude. There will be a uh, V2 initial down in this direction. We know we don't know its direction yet, but we'll figure that out pretty quick. And we'll find out something very interesting about collisions, elastic collisions between particles that have the same mass as two protons would. All protons are identical. Okay, so let's see what we can learn. We know that momentum will be conserved. So something we can say is that um, this will be, I'm just going to use m for the mass of a proton. So m v1 initial, that's the only momentum we have for starters, but that will equal m v1 final plus M V2, whoops, this should be V2 final down here. M V2 final. So initial momentum equals final momentum. So that's what we can say with conservation of momentum. We can split these things up into components. Uh, this only has an X component, but if I were to write these each with uh, things like that, I would say M V1 initial, 
is just going to equal m times the magnitude of v1 initial in the i hat direction. That's the x direction. Uh, m v1 final. I can write that in terms of i hat and j hat. Well, let's see. It'll actually be the cosine of 62.5. So m v1 final cosine of 62.5 degrees in the i hat direction, and it'll just be the sine of 62.5 degrees in the j hat direction. So um, that's in that regard. Uh, we haven't had anything that worked out that nicely with our original uh, projectile motion equations, but this one will. So um, m v1 final sine 62.5 degrees in the j hat direction. So that's just a little sloppy. I never start my equations far enough to the left. MV2 final, we don't really know yet, but I can say if this is the angle phi, MV2 final, it'll equal MV2 final cosine of phi in the i hat direction. So MV2 final, and hopefully you're good enough at this now that uh, this what I'm doing isn't too mysterious. And then it'll be a minus J hat component. So M V two final sine phi in the J hat direction. And that's a little crowded there, but try to divide them off there. Anyway, that's the initial and final momentums. Now, I haven't done anything with energy yet, but let's have a look at that. Uh, before the collision, the only energy we have is that of the first proton. And again, its mass is just m. So I'll have v1 initial squared. That's the speed squared. And this will equal 1 half m v1 final squared plus one half m v two final squared. Okay, oh, before I do too much, I wanna call attention to this thing here. This is an equation that just has three vectors in it. The m's in it are all identical. So if I divide them out, I get that v1 initial, will equal v1 final plus v2 final. Well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, that means that uh, if I just draw a little picture with that thing, okay, so here's v1 initial, it's gonna equal the vector sum of these two. Well, v1 final goes off that direction at 62.5 degrees. And then V2 final comes down here like that. Um, let's see, this is the angle phi. That'll make this angle phi over here. Huh, we ought to be able to figure out that. Maybe if we could figure out this angle here, and so far it may seem like we have a bunch of unknowns here, but this is V1 final there and V2 final there. So let's see what we get out of this equation. Okay, if I do take out all the one half Ms, I get that V1 initial squared is equal to V1 final squared plus V2 final squared. Huh, well, that's interesting. In this triangle that I've got drawn here, if I didn't know this angle here, and I knew V1 initial, V2 final, and V1 final, I could use the law of cosines to figure out this angle. And if I did, I would get, uh, let's just call this angle here beta, okay? I would say 
v1 initial squared is going to equal this side squared, v1 final squared plus this side squared, this is the law of cosines I'm using here, minus 2 v1 final v2 final cosine of beta. Okay, well, look at this. I know this is true because of conservation of energy. In order for this to be true, this has to be zero. Well, how is that possible? The only way it works is if the cosine of beta is zero, and that happens if beta is 90 degrees. This is a right triangle, and that means that 62.5 degrees plus 5 has to equal 90 degrees, so that 90 degrees plus 90 degrees is 180. Well, that's interesting. 62.5 degrees plus 5 is equal to 90 degrees. So phi is going to be 90 minus 62.5 degrees, which is, uh, let's see, 27.5 degrees. I better check that. I'm not feeling sharp this morning. Yep, 27.5 degrees. The question was, what's the direction of the target proton after the collision? It's that. Now, the only reason I was able to do that was because I was able to divide m out of this equation and m out of this equation. It's only when you have an elastic collision between identical particles that the angle between their trajectories after the collision is going to be equal to 90. So a very limited situation, but proton-proton scattering is something that's been thoroughly investigated in uh, particle accelerators and things like that. Also, uh, alpha particle, alpha particle scattering situations like that. So people have investigated this before, but it's a pretty neat result. Uh, how about the speeds of the two protons after the collision? Okay, well, that's going to take more paper. So but I think I can figure it out. Um, one thing I can say is that, uh, let's see. Oh, I think I can do this okay. Let's see, I'll have, um, if I look at my vector equations here, I have to have that the x components afterwards, mv1 initial is going to equal mv1 final cosine of 62.5 degrees um, plus mv1 final, it was going to be the sine, oh, that's the sine of 62.5 degrees. Now the m's all divide out, so this will be fairly simple. I know this, but I don't know either of these two things. But then I've also got that other equation, that zero, there was no y momentum to begin with. And if I, whoops, I think I took the wrong one off here. This was supposed to be v2 final cosine of, I was reading the wrong thing, cosine of phi, which is 27.5 degrees. So that's an equation. Then the y components have to combine to zero. So I'll have v1 final sine 62.5 degrees minus v2 final. I just took the m's off of these things because I was going to divide them out anyway, or maybe I should do that. Then one more step, I'll get rid of those things. Anyway, um, sine of 27.5 degrees. Okay, now I'll cross the m's off. Well, this equation will let me get, say, v1 in terms of v2 or vice versa. And so I could have uh, K 
kick that across, I'd get V2 final sine 27.5 degrees equals V in final sine 62.5 degrees. And um, well, let's just get V2 final. V2 final will be V1 final times the sine of 62.5 degrees over the sine of 27.5 degrees. And that's just a number. In fact, I think it's the tangent of 62.5 degrees, but um, actually, yeah. The sine of 27.5 would be the cosine of 62.5. This would be sine over cosine, which is tangent. But let's go ahead and do the sine divided by that. Or I will. Sine 62.5 divided by um, sine of 27.5. And I get 1.92 for that three significant figures, which just happens to be the tangent of 62.5 degrees. Okay, like I thought. So anyway, that's what V2 final is equal to, is 1.92 V1 final. Well, I can take that and stick it into that first equation up there, and I'll have V1 initial is equal to V1 final cosine 62.5 degrees plus um, V2 final goes up here and that's 1.92 V1 final times the cosine of 27.5 degrees, which ends up being V1 final times the cosine of 62.5 degrees plus 1.92 cosine of 27.5 degrees. I think I did that right. Yep. And this is just a number. So And I get all together. Um, whoops, I think this was supposed to be V1 initial. Yeah, because it came down from here. Um, anyway, V1 initial is going to equal 2.165 times V1 final, or V1 final equals V1 initial divided by 2.165. And finally, we go back to that number we had at the start, which was the initial velocity of V1, 5.35 times 10 to the fifth meters per second divided by 2.165, which is... Two point four seven times ten to the fifth. Meters per second. And V two final is one point nine two V one final. So if I just multiply that by one point nine two. I just figured out all kinds of stuff. I get 4.75 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. So seemed like a whole lot of unknown stuff there, but we figured out a lot. And we got something really interesting for collisions between identical mass particles. So uh, keep in mind that that's of limited application. Uh, the 
formula that we got or the fact that they or leave at right angles to each other, but at least it worked this time. So there's one. So another two dimensional collision that we've got there. Uh, this one is a different sort of thing. We have a 5.2 gram bullet moving at 672 meters per second, which is pretty darn fast. Let's see, that'd be, oh, let's see. 90, I don't know how fast it is. Don't want to do it in my head. Anyway, pretty fast. And it strikes a 700 gram wooden block at rest on a very smooth surface. Let's imagine that this thing is 7.00 times 10 squared grams. So at least we've, we'll have two sig figs on that and we can keep that. Otherwise we're down to one sig fig, which isn't very interesting. It emerges with its speed reduced to 428 meters per second. Find the resulting speed of the block. Okay, well, let's sketch the situation here. Uh, very smooth. That's code for frictionless. So we'll imagine that this block of wood is sitting on something like a, say, a Formica tabletop, which is actually what I'm working on here. And uh, we've got that. So initially, we've got this bullet coming along here, hitting the block of wood. And it actually tunnels through the block of wood. That's the initial situation. Afterwards, we've got the block of wood here. We've got the bullet going through it. And there would be a path bored through the block of the block of wood by the bullet. And while the bullet was doing that, it was exerting a rightward force on the block. So the block will acquire some momentum in that direction. The bullet was slowed down in the process because there was a leftward force on it. Um, this initial velocity was 672 meters per second. The final velocity of the bullet is 428 meters per second. And we'd like to know um, what is the final velocity of the block, which I'm gonna call V capital B. And for these two things, I'll use lowercase b's for the bullet before and after. Conservation of momentum tells us that M V bullet initially m bullet lowercase b and i'll write it as a vector equation but it's one dimensional so i'll almost immediately convert it into a scalar equation i'll have mass of the bullet vb final plus the mass of the block v block now, everything's to the right. I'll let positive be to the right. And so I can just write this as a scalar equation immediately. And mass of the bullet, VBI equals mass of the bullet, VB final plus the mass of the block, VB. And that's the speed of the block at the end or the velocity of the block at the end. Okay, well, numbers. Um, the mass of the bullet is equal to 5.2 grams. The mass of the block is that 7.00 times 10 squared grams. The velocity of the bullet initial is equal to 672 meters per second. The velocity of the bullet final, actually, if I say 672 meters per second to the right, then it's the velocity of the bullet. And the velocity of the bullet final is 428 meters per second to the right. And in both cases, I indicate that direction with the sign of it. So we have that. 
And we just, the only thing we don't know is the final velocity of the bullet. Well, we can do this pretty easily. If I subtract this from both sides, mass of the bullet, V bullet initial minus the mass of the bullet, V bullet final. This is the momentum lost by the bullet. It will equal the momentum gained by the block. So between this system of block and bullet, the momentum is conserved. And if I just divide both sides, actually I'll factor out the MB here. VB initial minus VB final, divide by the mass of the block, and that'll be the final velocity of the block. So this one was a relatively straightforward thing, probably easier than the two-dimensional ones we've done the last couple of times. So just plug in the numbers, uh, 5.2 grams, times whatever 672 minus 428, and those are both meters per second, and I'll just put the units out there. I think that's 200 and 42, 244, check that. Oh, well, we don't, we can do it all on the calculator. Mass of the block, 7.00 times 10 squared grams. Now notice I never bothered to convert things into kilograms here, but here I've got grams on top and grams on the bottom. So it doesn't matter. They're going to divide out and I'll just get a ratio of two masses. As long as they're in the same units, I'll be good there. So, oops. And I can keep two sig figs when I'm done. And I only get um, 1.8 meters per second. So not very fast. Uh, but that bullet lost a significant chunk of its speed. And the block picked up a little bit of speed, not a whole lot, 1.8 meters per second. But if that hits you in the nose, it'd hurt probably. However, it's better than getting hit by that thing. So... Anyway, there's one with uh, conservation of momentum with a tunneling problem, but you can still use conservation of momentum on something like that. Um, let's see. I've got a bunch of two-dimensional ones here, but here's one that's uh, a couple of asteroids and two asteroids of equal mass in this problem in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter collide with a glancing blow. Asteroid A, which was initially traveling at 40 meters per second is deflected 30 degrees from its original direction while asteroid B, which was initially at rest travels at 45 degrees to the initial direction of A. Find the speed of each asteroid after the collision. Now, again, um, it's most likely that an asteroid out in the asteroid belt is not going to be at rest. But if uh, you take the reference or the point of view of that asteroid B and be traveling along with it initially, then its initial velocity would be zero with respect to that reference frame. And you've got this asteroid A that comes in and hits it. So that's the viewpoint that we'd be thinking about. Um, not that B is necessarily initially at rest. If it was, it would actually fall straight toward the sun and uh, wouldn't have been in the asteroid belt very long. So we've got this. Now, something to notice here, um, we've got things of equal mass, but the angle between their velocities at the end is not 90 degrees. It's going to be 75.0 degrees. And the reason it isn't is because this isn't a 
an elastic collision. It's only in elastic collisions between objects of identical mass that you get that 90 degree thing. And in fact, two asteroids hitting each other is not going to be an elastic collision. They're going to make dents in each other. Actually, you'd probably have particles or pieces of rock scattered every which way, but we're going to assume at least they stay together. But they're going to deform each other, and that takes energy to do. So that energy would be stolen from the kinetic energy. So we can't use a kinetic energy equation here, but we can use conservation of momentum. So with the momentum, we can say that m sub a v a initial, that's the mass of asteroid a, or it does say they're equal mass, so I'll drop that subscript, I guess, I'll just call it M, is going to equal. This is the only thing that had momentum to begin with, but it will equal MVA final. That's the one taken off up there at the 30 degree angle, plus MVB final. So I have that. Well, I can divide the masses out right off the bat. So this equation simplifies to VA initial is going to equal VA final plus VB final. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, that's as much as I can say right now, but I can break those things into components. And let's pick a coordinate system. Let x be in the original direction, velocity direction for a, and y be perpendicular to it. And I can say that the a initial is just going to equal its magnitude, and I think that's 40 meters per second, in the i hat direction. So not so bad. The a final. Well, if I draw a picture of that, here's VA final. It has a 30.0 degree angle there. Lots of unlikely stuff here. This will be VA final cosine of 30.0. This will be VA final sine of 30.0 degrees. And if you're not good at that yet, keep working on that stuff so you get good at it. So you don't have to spend five minutes figuring this out. You can have it written down in 30 seconds instead. But don't rush it. Master it before you start trying to jump the conclusions. Anyway, I'll have VA final cosine of 30.0 degrees I hat plus VA final sine 30.0 degrees j hat. And then VB final, finally, um, as a vector, it will equal, well, I'll get a cosine of 45 degrees, its magnitude, in the i hat direction. And then a minus the sign, it's going to have a negative component in the y direction. So minus the B final sign of 45.0 degrees in the j hat direction. So there. Now, this will equal this plus this. If I just look at the i hat terms, I'll have the A initial is equal to final cosine of 30.0 degrees plus the final cosine of 45 degrees, zero degrees, and J hat terms. I get zero. 
is equal to VA final sine of 30 minus VB final sine of 45.0 degrees. So this is now almost identical to the last problem, at least. Between these two, I can solve for one of them in terms of the other, plug that into here, and won't have much work to do. So let's just start off with the J hat terms. Um, I'm going to solve it for VA or VB final. Okay, I'll bring that across and then divide both sides by sine of 45. Two algebra steps at once. Make sure you know what I'm doing. VB final will equal VA final times the sine of the point zero degrees divided by the sine of 45.0 degrees. Now be careful, don't jump to conclusions about this. You actually have to do that division because these are functions of things and you can't deal with the 30 and the 45 right off the bat. Um, there may be some kind of a uh, trig identity for that, but I doubt it. Or I wouldn't worry about looking it up. It's easy enough to punch into your calculator. Oh, good grief. Square root of 2 over 2 is what I get out of this thing. Um, but I don't like that. Oh. 0 0.707, I should have been able to do that in my head. Um, when I took trig in high school, you had to memorize stuff like the square root of two is 1.414 and stuff like that. Anyway, 0 0.707 VA final. Okay, so now in this other equation, I can see say that VA initial is equal to VA final cosine of 30.0 degrees plus, instead of VB final, I'm going to write 0.707 VA final and I still have that cosine of 45 on here. So So, okay, and then that's just arithmetic to do from there. So once you know VA final, then you can come back to this equation and solve for VB final. And the interesting math is done. So it was getting these two equations set up that was the, the physics of the problem and the interesting physics. Any questions on that one? It's kind of unbelievable, um, especially 40.0 meters per second. Imagine that. And then the nice angles here, 30.0 degrees and 45.0 degrees. But we're going to make up something, I guess. It's going to look something like that. OK. I um, can't remember if I had. Let's see, that was the proton-proton scattering. This one we already did, I think. Seems familiar. Yeah, these last two maybe are a little more interesting. OK, so a 15-gram bullet traveling at 505 meters per second strikes a block of wood with a mass of 0 0.850 kilograms. It is on a table edge 75.5 centimeters above the floor. If the bullet buries itself in the block, find how far from the table edge the block lands. Okay, well, here's our situation. We've got a table here. We have a block that's just sitting there, barely balanced. I better make it a little better balanced than that. Anyway, there's the block to begin with, balanced on the table edge. And the floor is 75.5 
I think I'll call that 0.755 meters just for the heck of it above the floor. And the bullet comes along here, embeds itself in the block, and that's going to happen in some very few number of milliseconds, probably. And so the block won't e even have time to go anywhere before that bullet has come to rest. And now we have a conservation of momentum thing, and this will go sailing down there. So in one dimension, here's what we've got. We've got the mass of the bullet, the V bullet initial, and I'm just going to say positive is to the right. So far, this will be a one-dimensional problem. We'll equal the mass of the bullet plus the mass of the block. It gets a capital B times V, lowercase b, capital B, final. The final velocity of that bullet block combination. And we can figure it out pretty easy. When you've got a completely inelastic collision, that's when the two objects stick together after the collision. That's what the equation looks like for it. The initial momentum of the one object will equal the final momentum of the two objects stuck together. So there we have it. So we can figure out how fast they're going to start with. So VB capital V final will equal I just divide both sides by the total mass. So mass of the individual bullet, mass of the bullet plus the block times that initial speed or initial velocity of that thing. Okay, 15.0 grams. Hmm, this I could write as 850 kilograms or 8.50. Anyway, mass of the bullet. Actually, I'll convert the whole thing into kilograms just for the heck of it. They're going to divide out anyway. That would be times 10 to the minus third kilograms divided by 15.0 times 10 to the minus third kilograms plus 0 0.850 kilograms, and be careful with units on this. Whoops, and I have to multiply that by 505 meters per second. Yeah, so the, the velocity of that combination, as it's leaving the tabletop, is going to be, I can do this, And for this ratio, I get 1.73 times 10 to the minus 2 when I multiply it by 505. I get um, not so much speed anymore. 8.76 and yeah, three sig figs here, three sig figs there. So we're OK. Um, meters per second is all the faster it's going. So now we've got a new problem. And this takes us back to our earlier days of the quarter. We've got this thing that's initially sailing off of here, a block with a bullet embedded in it, with V naught equal to 8.76 meters per second. And I'm going to let that be x in that direction and y in this direction, and that'll be in the i hat direction. So there, and it's initially 0.755 meters off the floor. I think we did a lab like this once. So how far from the table edge does the block land? 
Well, what's its time of flight? This is a projectile now. So something I can say for projectile motion is, I know V naught, it's all in the I hat directions. So V naught X is 8.76 meters per set. V naught Y is zero. Um, y naught, I'll say is 0.755 meters. I'll let X naught equal zero. Just call this launching point the zero point. I want to know how far away it lands. My projectile motion equations, if I recall, look something like Y is equal to Y naught plus V naught Y minus one half G T squared. And X is equal to X naught plus V naught X. Whoops, there's supposed to be a T on here. V naught X times T. So I'll deal with that when I know how long it takes to hit the floor. Well, when it hits the floor, Y is going to equal zero. V naught Y is zero. So I'll get zero is equal to Y naught minus one half G T squared or I can figure out how long it takes to hit the floor. A little bit of algebra, and I'd get t squared is equal to 2y naught divided by g, or t is equal to that to the 1 half. So let's go ahead and solve for t. So the time of flight is going to be I get 0.393 seconds. So how far will it travel in the X direction in 0.393 seconds? Well, X is going to equal X naught, which is zero. It's just V naught X T, which is 8.76 meters per second times 0.393 seconds and this isn't bad, but we're having to pull in stuff from way back about six weeks ago, I think. Okay, and I get about 3.44 meters. So all kinds of things getting pulled back in on some of these problems. So. Uh, one of the problems on the homework actually deals with uh, a package that's sliding off of a chute and leaves the chute with a particular velocity and uh, you're supposed to figure out, and then it lands in a cart and you have to figure out the final speed of the cart after that happens. So, oops, I did that one. I guess that's the last one for today. Well, let's see, what have we got? A pendulum consists of a 0 0.400 kilogram bob attached to a string of length 1.60 meters. So block of mass M rests on a horizontal frictionless surface. The pendulum is released from rest at an angle of 53 degrees with the vertical. So it's going to swing down here, hit the mass, and it says it collides elastically with the block. A little bit hard to believe, but let's go for it anyway. Following the collision, the maximum angle of the pendulum with the vertical is 5.73 degrees. So presumably it's going to bounce off the thing and swing back up to 5.73 degrees instead of 53 degrees and determine the mass M for that to happen. Hmm, this is kind of complicated. Now, if that thing has a length of 1.60 meters, by the way, we'll assume that that 1.63 meters is the distance to the center of the bob that's on there. 
or maybe this bob is tiny, something like that. So initially, that thing will be some distance above where it is when it strikes that thing. And if I do this, um, this will be 1.63 meters here. How much higher is it when it's up here at this thing? In other words, coming back to here, what's this distance? Let's see. This is 53. It's actually 53.0 degrees. Doesn't show it on that drawing, but it is in the text. Okay, well, this distance here is going to be this divided by that will equal the cosine of 53. So this will be this thing cosine of 53. So 1.63 cosine of 53.0 is going to be 0 0.981 meters. This little distance here, which I'm going to call h, is actually 1.63 meters minus 0 0.981 meters. And actually that's going to look like 0.65 meters. That's all I can keep significant figures by is because the uncertainty shows up here at first. So that's the how much higher the bob is at the start than it is when it's going to be smacking into that. Now, why do I want to know that? Because it'll have gravitational potential energy to begin with. It loses that as it swings down, and that'll be converting into kinetic energy. So the initial energy here, mgh, will equal one half. Ooh, I got to be careful with my. <laughs> I've got a bob and I've got a block again. Oh, let's see. All right. And that's a lowercase m. Well, I'll call this the mass of the bob, and this will be the mass of the block. And that's the thing that's equal to, oh, we don't know. That's what we're going to be after. All right. Mass of the bob plus half mass of the block times v bob initial squared. And we can solve for that. Uh, we know what h is, 0.65 meters. The masses here divide out because it's the same object on both sides here. And I can say that v bob initial squared is just going to equal 2gh. Or the initial speed of that thing will be the square root of 2gh. I'm just going to do it and be done with it. Let's see. Okay, oh, got to take that to the one half. I get about 3.57 meters per second. Actually, that's a pretty long pendulum thing there. So that's how fast the, the bob is going when it runs into that thing. Now, we have a collision in which momentum is going to be conserved. And I suspect that the um, bob is going to bounce off of this thing and come back up like that. Otherwise, it'll continue through in that direction. Um, we don't have a way of knowing that just yet. Uh, but 
uh, we will have kinetic energy conserved in this thing. So, because it says elastically, but let's just write down a conservation of momentum thing. I'm gonna let positive be to the left for this little part that I'm gonna do here. And what I'll have for the initial momentum is the mass of the bob times V bob initial is what I'm calling it. And I'm writing it as a scalar because this is a one dimensional thing for starters. And so that's the momentum that I've got to begin with. Now that'll equal the mass of the block times the capital B, and this, I'll just call that the final thing. It's a horizontal frictionless surface, so it's going to sail along with that forever. And plus the mass of the bob times V bob final. Okay, now I don't know what direction that's going to equal, but maybe it won't matter. Okay, however, um, we still have the conservation of kinetic energy to consider here and uh, see what we can get out of that. Um, I have the feeling it's going to bounce backwards, but we don't know for sure. So then all we have to do is figure out the maximum, or we're told the maximum angle of the pendulum with the vertical is 5.73 degrees. <clears throat> but is it that way or that way? That's what we don't know. Um, except, let's see, we can say that the kinetic energy is conserved. So we'll have this, the B comma initial squared is going to equal the kinetic energy of that, one half m sub b, the b final squared plus one half m sub little b, b little b final squared. And so there is momentum conservation of energy, and uh, we don't know like the mass of the block, we don't know its final speed, so we can't do a whole lot with figuring things out here, except we're given following the collision, the maximum angle of the pendulum with the vertical is 5.73 degrees. I'm going to call this thing theta final, and so I'll have that. And with that theta final, if I assume it's over on this side, and I'm going to let 1.63 meters equals L, um, so it's going to be up here. This is going to be, this distance here is going to be L cosine of theta final. This little distance down here is going to be H. This L cosine theta final only goes to there. So lots of complications in this problem. But um, L, H again, is going to equal L, the total distance down here, minus L cosine of theta final. And this kinetic energy of the bob at the end is going to get converted into gravitational potential energy. And so I'll be able to say that one half the mass of that bob times, whoops, I used a capital B here. This should have been a <clears throat> lowercase b. I can say that that initial or kinetic energy of the bob after it bounces off the mass. So that's going to be this. 
will equal m sub little b times g, oops, I'm gonna call this h final, times h final. Well, this is complication, <laughs> all kinds of it, but it's gonna equal the mass of the little block g times, um, well, I'll put L here and then have one minus the cosine of theta final there. And I know what theta final is. So <laughs> um, this is an expression that has little m or the mass of the bob on both sides of it. I can use that to figure out what this has to be <clears throat> magnitude wise. I can use that to figure out what this has to be. And so this one's solving a whole bunch of things in order to try and solve this problem. I would not put a problem like this on the test because it's crazy complicated. <clears throat> However, um, here we can divide the mass of the bob out of there. And I can say that b little b final squared is gonna equal multiply out from underneath by two. I'd have two times g, which you know, times L, which is the length of the string, 1.60 meters, times one minus the cosine of 5.73 degrees. And those are all numbers, okay? We can solve for every one of these things. In fact, let's go ahead and find that final velocity of the, uh, of the bob bouncing off of there and then just kind of do it. Okay, so two times G. Times L be 1.60 meters. Times one minus the cosine of 5.73 degrees. And I get, let's see, for that thing squared, it's 0.15, but I want to take the square root. Okay, and so the bob bounces off of the block at 0.3. I'm pretty sure I can only keep two significant figures on here. Well, let's see. Um, what one minus the cosine of 5.73 degrees is. It's uh, 0.50 just about. Hmm. No, wait. 4.99 times 10 to the minus third. Holy cow, tiny number. Okay. Well, let's see. Maybe it's that, but um, I'd have to dig through here pretty carefully to figure out how many significant figures we could actually keep on that. But that'll be the final velocity of this block. You can come back to this equation and actually solve for the mass of the block based or knowing this, because you know VB initial, V bob initial, you know V bob final, and you know the mass of the bob. So, oh wait, nope, that's still two unknowns. You don't know the mass of the block and you don't know the final velocity of the block. So you'd have a little more work to do to, to figure this thing out. <clears throat> I guess if you know the final kinetic energy of the block and its final momentum, yeah, you'd have to do some algebra. I'll finish this problem and, um, and bring it to the class tomorrow. And uh, got your tests graded, so I'll give those back right at the start. 
of lab tomorrow too. And I put in a work request to get that computer in the front of the classroom fixed so we can be working on the graphing for that radioactive decay lab and uh, should be able to finish that up tomorrow. And for tomorrow, there will be a quiz on a simple conservation of momentum problem, nothing like this thing. So uh, we'll have a much simpler one, but I'll put up an announcement about that too. So I haven't seen any questions today. I don't know how many people, I've only got two of us here today. I guess this is low pressure stuff. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end this.